And it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. John Sorrentino, who started his practice in 1991 with a commitment to patient care through education. He believes that with proper care, everyone can maintain their teeth for a lifetime. He grew up in the Hudson Valley. He received his bachelor's degree from the State University of New York at Binghamton and his doctor dental medicine DMD degree from the University of Connecticut School of Dental Medicine. In 2003, he was awarded a fellowship in the Academy of General Dentistry. The fellowship is symbolic of Dr. Sorrentino's commitment to lifelong learning and bringing the highest quality dental care to his patients. He is a member and past president of the Dutchess County Dental Society. He is also a member of the New York State Society of Forensic Dentistry and was actively involved in the identification of victims of the World Trade Center disaster and Flight 587. Lately, he has been researching the history of decay and formulating strategies to eliminate it. Dr. Sorrentino, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's my pleasure, Howard. Like I, I said, I'm a big, big fan. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so I invited you. Uh, you didn't invite yourself. I want to get you on. Um, it seems like, um, you know, what we should do first, th there's nine specialties in dentistry. And everybody always talks about oral surgeons and perio and ortho, but they don't really talk about public health. And it seems like the, the mission of dentistry should be primarily to prevent disease instead of drill, fill, and build. Instead of sitting on an assembly line just doing MOD composites per, from age 25 to 65, how could we prevent more cavities than we do today? Very simple. We need to look at the past to go to the future. Uh, for example, let me start by asking you a question. How many wild animals living on their natural diet get tooth decay? Uh, Winnie the Pooh eating honey. That's about it. The answer is none. So there's a biological mismatch that if humans are getting tooth decay, I assert we're not eating a species appropriate diet. And I've done a deep dive because I have a background most dentists don't, and that's um, an area in um, anthropology and human origins. And, you know, I have a good friend who has a PhD in anthropology and teaches. And, you know, he, when he was working on his PhD at Stony Brook, he took me into the bone room. Now, this is in 1990. I'm only a few years younger than you. I was a newly minted dentist. And he showed me all these Paleolithic skulls. And it amazed me, but, and it left an impression that none of them had decay. And I'd ask, how old is this one? And he'd say 15,000 years. I think we had stuff that was 45,000 years old. And keep in mind that the toothbrush wasn't even invented until 3,000 years ago. So the bottom line is people are eating things that they shouldn't eat. When you look at the fossil record, you're first starting to see decay in the Middle East, uh, notably Mesopotamia, 12,000 years ago, or 10,000 BC, and it comes with the age of agriculture. And I made the observation that dentistry is just not doing it right. And it took me two or three years to figure out, number one, how to do it right, and the part that dentistry got so wrong. And it seems to me that we spend a lot of tea, that in dentistry, what we've done is we've conflated normality, okay, with um, that um, we think decay is normal, okay? It's not normal. It's a disease, and the way to, to do it, to get rid of it, is to return to what I term species-appropriate diet. And, what, and when you were looking at these Paleolithic skulls, they also lack malocclusions, correct? Correct. Less than, in fact, uh, less than 5% of Paleolithic skulls demonstrate malocclusions. And the ones that do, you've got like a couple incisors overlapping. That's it. So, so um, do you think the diet also changed the malocclusion? I think the diet affected the growth and development. And that, again, I meant to say before, uh, we're conflating commonality with normality. None of this is normal. Well put, commonality with... So it just becomes the new norm. Everybody just eats packaged food and drinks uh, soda, and we just think that it's just normal for every two-year-old to come in with cavities. Yes, and I'll tell you exactly why it happened. Is that 
dental schools and medical schools for that matter, do not teach evolutionary biology, nor do they require it as a uh, prerequisite for admission. That all we'd have to do to fix this is um, have every dental school dean sit down with uh, some anthropologists from their local college and have them explain it to them and then teach it. I, I was very lucky. Um, our, our anatomy teacher at you know, University of Missouri, Kansas City was Bernard Butterworth. And he was, uh, I remember the first time I asked him a question, he said, well, I can't answer it any better than this book. And he gave, handed me his own copy of the book, uh, The Naked Eight by Desmond Morris. And that was my first turn on to anthropology. And it, it was just amazing. So what, what do you think is the appropriate um, species human diet uh, for Homo sapiens? That is a great question. And uh, it's a somewhat long-winded answer. Uh, first of all, let's, okay, let's get a few, few terms straight. Humans have been walking the earth for 2.5 million years. Homo sapiens have been walking the earth for between 200 and 300,000 years. We were defined as human by our genus, not our species. So when I say humans, I'm generally referring to the two and a half million year number. Um, it depends where on the planet we are, and when I say where on the planet, the latitude. We evolved in the equatorial zone in East Africa. And then, are you familiar with the, um, or are your listeners familiar with the out of Africa theory? Um, re reviewed for them. Um, and, and, also, and also, the latest finding, they, they found a 9.6 million year old tooth in a German cave. That kind of was very surprising. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of oddities out there, and that's certainly one of them. Um, basically, the out-of-Africa theory is the current model of human planetary domination. We left Africa crossing from um, the east horn of Africa into, some, into uh, Yemen, okay, during two ice ages ago, when uh, water levels were much lower, and then we followed the waterways around the Earth, okay, first into Mesopotamia, then India, so a species-appropriate diet for humans has to take in a lot, a lot of seafood. And when I say seafood, I don't just mean fish. I mean sea vegetables, what we commonly call seaweed. Uh, you have the, um, the enzymatic uh, engine to uh, digest this sort of thing. Also, some of the first hunting and gathering we did is it didn't take these tribes long to figure out that the tide reversed every six hours. So if you had a net, You'd go in at high tide and put your net at, over the mouth of a small creek or stream, and then when the tide lowered, you'd have a virtual smorgasbord. Now, nothing suggests seafood is important for humans more than our daily obligate need for iodine. And yet, we have no means to store it. So, and the main so the repository of iodine on the planet is ocean. So. You need that for neural development. You need it for um, yeah, thyroid, proper thyroid function. So, um, and, and that's why a lot of advanced countries uh, mandate that salt be iodized because it's that important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that seems to be a public health thing that worked out very well. That, uh, you know, we're getting iodine because humans live everywhere. But, I mean, you can't find a major city on the planet that isn't on a major waterway. Like, for example, the fat make up um, oysters and uh, mussels and clams are the same ones of the same omega-3 fatty acids that make up your brain. Okay, in the same ratio. Um, other than that, I would say uh, green leafy vegetables and fruit in season. Humans did not begin eating grains until 12,000 years ago. And, and again, the seafood-based diet and, uh, you know, Fruit is the only part of the plant that's actually designed by the plant to be eaten by us. And you got to look at the people that we evolved from, what they ate. And these people didn't have cavities, okay? They didn't have diabetes. They didn't have heart disease. And they certainly were not obese. I mean, I started doing this. The first thing I did is I took 40 pounds off myself, and I dropped my BMI from 26 to 21. 
And my physician, when I told him how he did it, I did it, uh, he didn't believe me. And I said, why didn't you tell me when I had a BMI of 26 that I was overweight? And the answer is because when you go into your physician, he's working with people with BMIs of 30 and 32. And he said, hey, this guy's doing pretty good. And uh, like I said, grains are not part of the diet. And um, it doesn't matter if it's uh, whole grains or refined grains. That, um, And I would invite anybody to uh, invest $16 in a glycometer and then eat a slice of white bread and watch over the next hour what your uh, blood glucose does and then do it the next day with a slice of uh, wheat bread and you're going to see the same exact response. And, and what is that device called? A glucometer? Glucometer. Yes, you can get it in any drugstore. Diabet diabetics use it for measuring their blood sugar. You know, finger sticks. Okay, so it's a little pinprick on your finger and then you... Might, so what do you recommend that? Um, you do that an hour after you eat? You do it, um, you do it um, seven or eight times every 15 minutes after you eat a slice of white bread. You know, get up, you know, in a fasted state. You get up in the morning and you take a, um, you eat a slice of white bread or you do a finger stick, you get your fasting glucose and then you eat the white bread and then you do it every 15 minutes for uh, two hours. And you'll see, you'll see a nice glucose rise. And then the next day do it with wheat bread, you'll see the same thing. Okay. These are not species appropriate foods for, for humans. Um, you know, until we dentists start um, living that message, you know, we're going to have, you know, more and more of the same. So is it still, uh, your glucose should be between 80 and 120, uh, what, what is yes. it, uh, per, uh, what is yeah. it, micrograms per deciliter, or what, what's the unit on that? I think milligrams per deciliter. Milligrams and per deciliter? I believe so. Um, and that is something that your body actually wants to keep. That if you are in a starvation state, your body, you can go roughly, if you're healthy, as long as you stay hydrated, you know, six to eight weeks before you starve to death. If you look at somebody in that state, if you look at their blood glucose, it is going to stay in that range. That is highly conserved in the body. Your body will do other bad things, like you won't be able to form mucus, you know, you'll get a dry hack, you know, and uh, other systems will shut down. But up until the very end, your body maintains a uh, blood glucose of 85 to 105. Um, and every time that we eat things that aren't species appropriate, we raise insulin, okay, which is a pro-inflammatory hormone, okay, it drives glycation and the formation of advanced glycation end products. And, you know, okay, that is what drives inflammation. And this is a very hard concept for people to understand that we are not calorically controlled. We are not controlled by the amount of calories we eat. We are hormonally controlled. That when insulin is out of whack, and the reason it goes out of whack is it's, is it's, um, it's rising, okay, because it wants to drive that excess glucose out of the blood. And what happens? We get fat. What also happens? is if you want to talk about teeth and the systemic theory of tooth decay, uh, which I'm a big fan of, um, what it does is it shuts down the pressure gradient in the, um, in the teeth and uh, makes you more susceptible to tooth decay. Are you familiar with that? No. Okay. Go back to your dental school, ask for your tuition money back. They didn't teach me either. <laughs> okay. There is a, the parotid gland is like a, um, is like the pancreas. It's a dual function. It has an um, endocrine function as well as an exocrine function. It releases a hormone called parotid hormone. And what that does is it drives a pressure gradient from the inside of the tooth to the outside of the tooth so that there's actual fluid flow. That if you dry off, okay, and watch it over time, you will see the surface get moist because the pressure gradient is... Um, works that way. Now, what blocks that pressure gradient? Sugar. When you eat sugar, it shuts it down. And so plaque is more likely to form. It doesn't have that pressure gradient driving it off the tooth. And um, this is all uh, detailed. It's called the systemic theory of tooth decay. Uh, there's a great paper on it. And uh, I've got the reference here I'll give you. What's the paper called? It's called the systemic theory of tooth decay. 
Oh, the systemic theory of dental caries by Dr. Ken Southward. It's in the Journal of Academy of General Dentistry, the September, October, 2011 issue. But nice. I have it, I'll post it. Okay. So what does that say? What does that tell us? It basically says that um, it ties tooth decay to the inflammatory response. Like first, first of all, like I said, we're not calorically controlled, we're hormonally controlled, okay? What that means is that, uh, and I was talking about insulin, but um, in the case of, to of uh, tooth decay, it's driven or shut down by the hormone, parotid hormone, pH, secreted by the parotid glands. And uh, it, it's, a very, it's a fascinating read. It's not very, very long. It's only five or six pages. Um, and basically, we're working currently with the, um, the acid theory of tooth decay, which is uh, proposed by Miller in the 1940s. And there's, this, this theory was proposed in the 1950s, and I can't remember the gentleman's name. But um, it's basically, the acid theory that we were all taught is an incomplete that the treatment is the same, you know, drill, fill, bill. But, you know, I keep coming back to a species-appropriate diet. If we eat it, you're never going to, you're not even going to need a toothbrush, let alone um, get decay. Interesting. So, um, yeah, I, I just found that. Um, the uh, JAGD, uh, is that where the resorted, the systemic theory of dental caries by Ken Southward, DDS, MAGD. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I interesting. So, so continue. So, uh, ba basically, um, the, the carbohydrates, the sugars, okay, shut it down and it forms a cascade response okay, where it changes the redox state and it becomes favorable to plaque formation and decay formation. And different people have different redox states and the higher it is, the more likely, uh, I mean, the more free radicals are running around and the more likely you are to get decay. So you and think that that's replacing the, the acid theory of tooth decay? It's not really replacing the acid theory, it's building on the acid theory. The acid theory isn't wrong. It's just, it's part, part of the equation. Now, uh, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, in your career, you've seen a number of uh, patients with bulimia, right? Mm -hmm. I think most dentists have. One thing that always amazed me, um, according to this theory, is I see lots of lingually exposed dentin, but very little decay. You know, we were all taught that dentin is softer than enamel, which it is. And I was wondering why it has always had this glassy appearance. And the reason the uh, matrix of dentin is impervious to an acid attack. That when, um, when um, the parotid hormone is shut down, okay, it blocks um, collagenase, uh, is what attacks and destroys the um, organic part of the dentin. And, get, and that's when the case steps in. So, you know, you don't usually see that in bulimics. You, you see this fine, glassy dentin that, uh, that they have. That it just, and I always wondered why it didn't decay. And that's the answer. And that's all in the paper. He goes through that. And, it, it, do you, and what about GERD? GERD? About, um, they'll, they'll have, as far as the teeth are concerned? Yeah. Yeah. They'll have the same, the same exact uh, issue, that unless they have a high sugar diet shutting everything down, the collagenase isn't going to be working. So uh, the um, acid can do its work, and the body's collagenases can come in, and they take out the dentin, and, and they'll wind up with a lot of decay. But it's so, only if that happens. So in your practice uh, as a dentist, do you um, talk a lot about nutrition and diet? Absolutely. And... Uh, what, the, what it does is when you get the patient, okay, to discover what they're doing wrong, it transfers ownership of the problem from the dentist to the patient. For example, if you do a bunch of crowns or some uh, root canals and the patient comes back uh, six months, two years, three years later, and they wind up with decay, you know, there's always that um, element of projection where they say, I spent all this money and it didn't work. And you say, well, what did you eat? What did I tell you to eat? 
you know, if you're eating things that aren't bad for you, God himself could have done the dental treatment and you're going to wind up with decay. Or um, another way to look at it is like this. Do you remember every first year dental student, sometimes on the first day, they see a Venn diagram with uh, three interlocking circles. One says teeth, one says bacteria, and one says uh, carbohydrates. Do you know, uh, not, I'm not putting you on the spot, but do you know what your daily obligate need for uh, carbohydrates are? Uh, no. Zero. Zero? Has, has no need. Zero. Okay, we have a process called gluconeogenesis. It'll provide all the glucose that your brain will need. Okay, as dentists, okay, we've been giving fluoride to strengthen teeth. We've been teaching oral hygiene to, um, to um, um, get rid of the bacteria. But we need, it's a three-legged stool, and the way that dentistry wins, and believe me, I like to win, is to kick that stool, that leg, out from underneath the carbohydrate one. That you do not need them, that your body will live better without them, and the, the, um, the implications are much greater than dentistry. I'm talking about, you know, not only ending tooth decay, okay, this will put a huge dent in obesity, this will put a huge dent in type 2 diabetes, and this will put a huge dent in cardiovascular disease. Do you think those diseases are reversible? Um, yes, I do, okay. Um, over over a, to a point, I mean, if you're, you know, you know, the point where you need, um, you know, end state uh, diabetes. And I'm talking about adult onset diabetes, uh, where the pancreas is just burnt out. I don't think you can ever come back from something like that. But I think that you know, doing what I say uh, will bring things, make things, uh, you know, certainly better. That you know, if you have a problem with weight, um, the hormone there is leptin. I was talking about parotid hormone before. That's what controls uh, decay in teeth. But as far as obesity, um, leptin is a hormone produced in your fat cells that feed back to um, the hypothalamus in your brain to tell you you're full. And sugars and starches bypass that, that feedback loop. Now, there's a number of sites, and I'll link, I'll link to it on my, um, you know, on my thread when I, um, when I set it up, uh, called the Leptin Reset, that was uh, put together by one of my classmates, Dr. Jack Cruz who's now a neurosurgeon, and, you know, I did it, and that's, that was the key to losing 40 pounds, and, and I'll tell you, honestly, Howard, one night in January of 2011, I was laying in bed, and I said, if the problem with obesity is carbohydrates, and this is right in the middle of when I was losing, losing the weight, I said, uh, it occurred to me that as a dentist, that carbohydrates are the sole cause of dental disease, and I'm like, I have it, okay? We don't need more dental schools, okay? We don't need more access to care. In fact, um, there's a lot of hand-wringing about the access to care. Access to care is two things. People who are unwilling or unable, for financial reasons or other, to go to the dentist. Teaching uh, species appropriateness, in eating a natural diet of what people should be eating, okay? This all goes by the wayside. You know, I'm attacking the... Um, demand side of the problem, not the supply side of the, of the problem. That, uh, I mean, you know, just because somebody's poor, you have, you have your birthright as a human is to have healthy teeth and to have a healthy body, okay? And the answer isn't, you know, dragging them into a dental office or putting clinics um, and subsidizing people to go there. It's to teach people what species appropriate for humans to eat, okay, and then putting an end to our need. I judge the metrics differently. I think we're succeeding when we close dental schools because we're not needed, not opening more. It's, um, it's, it, the, the, the cards are stacked against Americans because 10 companies control um, almost every large food and beverage brand in the world. I mean, it's Nestle, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, Unilever, Danone, General Mills, Kellogg's, Mars, Associated British Food, and Mondelez. And when you go into Walmart um, or you go into Kroger, or you go into the grocery store, I mean, the, the, those countries, I mean, they just want to sell packaged goods. And, and it's so tough for Americans that they, they walk into a Kroger and there's 60,000 SKU items 
made by these 10 companies, how do you help your, uh, how, how do Americans get around those 10 companies? Okay, it's even worse than you said, because if you look at the advertising, they're always selling us about, telling us about how busy we are and how their product is going to help us uh, because it's going to buy more time in our day. So, uh, yeah, I understand exactly what you're saying. I tell my patients to shop around the outside of the supermarket. You know, I, I mean, this isn't anything earth shaking that, uh, you know, don't buy anything in a box. Um, I think as a profession, okay, what we have to do is identify uh, the problem and then identify the solution. Now, dentistry has done a great job. Everybody knows that a Snickers bar is not good for your teeth. Everyone knows it. What I'm telling you is that bread isn't good for your teeth, okay? That pasta causes cavities. And people look at me, I've had dentists look at me funny like that. And I said, I said, do you have an enzyme in your saliva called amylase? And they think about it and say, yeah. I said, well, what does it do? I said, it turns starches into sugars in your mouth. I said, nobody had a cavity till uh, Mesopotamia uh, 12,000 years ago, okay? That's what they were eating. They were eating grains. And they were having, um, you know, all kinds of uh, other problems. This is where diabetes was first recorded. Um, I've examined a number of Egyptian mummies. Okay, diabetes is a word that has to do with water. Okay, and I've never seen a mummy that didn't have tooth decay. Now, maybe they were rich people, but again, they weren't eating Snickers bars. Okay, the only sweetener the Egyptians had was honey. Okay, and it was very expensive. They were a bread-eating civilization. And these people got decay. The Mesopotamians were eating eating porridge. Um, I'll mention my friend, uh, who's anthrop anthropologist, is Dr. Uh, Peter Unger of the University of Arkansas, and we worked on a project together. And I asked him. I said, "It seems to me, pre-Columbian America would be the per perfect place to look at um, at uh, decay rates, because first of all." Um, he studies teeth because teeth survive very well in the fossil record. And uh, he said, I said, do you see decay in pre-Columbian civilizations in, uh, in America? And he says, yes and no. He says, says uh, pre-Columbian America was a mixture of hunter-gatherer societies and um, agricultural societies. Like you might remember the pilgrims came over, they were taught to grow corn and squash and stuff. Okay, that was an agricultural society but there were plenty of um, hunter-gatherer societies. And his answer was very simple. We see decay in agricultural societies. We don't see any decay in hunter-gatherer societies. Now, we're not trying to, you know, reconstruct their diet piece for piece. We're trying, I want to look at the actual macronutrient content of the diets and try to emulate it and use it as a template. And I think that, that's how we win. I don't expect it to happen overnight, you know, but um, I think our message has to be um, clear on it. It's got to be different. I mean, if we, if it was um, just uh, drilling, filling, and tra training more dentists, we would have won this three years ago. Okay. And the hardest thing I've ever tried to do is effect paradigm change. And to ask my profession to do it, I know that it's gonna, it's gonna take a while. Um, so it, it, it's really corruption. Then I mean, I, I look at the obesity rates, the um, the uh, diabetes rates, and yet the United States government still subsidizes corn farmers and wheat farmers. I, I mean, what, what what do you think of the America and, and the um, the food pyramid that's put out by our own government recommends several servings of uh, grains and bread? Yes, it does. Uh, it's very simple. That uh, just take that pyramid, turn it upside down. And that's. Um, I mean, I mean, it's a cliche. I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. Okay. Right. Um, very simple. I'll give you the 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 answer to all those questions is found in Gary Taub's book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. And I'll give you the I'll give you the 30 second version. It is basically. The Germans had this figured out in the 1920s. Uh, then, in the 1930s, Germany went to war. All their scientists went to war and were killed. Then what happened is we won the war. So we looked at the German science as bad, 
and the American science is good. And then in the 1950s, there was a researcher at, uh, up in Minnesota named Ansel Keys that uh, postulated that a low-fat diet would be good. And so Dr. Keyes became president of the American Heart Association. Fast forward another 15 years, in 1977, the McGovern Commission uh, recommended a, um, a uh, low-fat diet to Americans. And then if you look at what the um, actual rate of uh, obesity has since 1977, it's gone like a rocket. So, but, you know, it, it's a big book, but it's a good read, and it explains. Um, he also talks a lot about... What's the name of the book again? Good Calories, Bad Calories. Good Calories, Bad Calories. Like Gary Taubes, T-A-U-B-S. Okay. Good Calories, Bad Calories. So, so what are the good calories? What are the bad calories? Uh, good, good calories are um, uh, natural seafood, uh, grass-fed meats, um, uh, green leafy vegetables, fruit in season. You know, it's funny when you say fruit in season because I'm 56. When I was little, we all knew when the strawberries would come in season. We knew when the things were season, and then. As I got older and airplane travel and I uh, got cheaper and greenhouses and all that stuff, now um, little kids don't understand the seasons because they can go buy strawberries at the grocery store year round. Correct. And one thing I'm not sure if I uh, mentioned it or even emphasized it before that fruit and season changes with the latitude that you're at. So if you're in the tropics, you can certainly eat more fruit. Okay. Or if you're an Eskimo in northern Alaska, that's probably not something that should be part of your diet. Where I live in New York, like for example, I don't eat bananas because they don't grow in Poughkeepsie. You know, but uh, you know, I eat, uh, I'll start in the winter, I'll eat berries. Um, through the summer, I'll eat plums and, and, um, and, uh, and uh, peaches. And now, I mean, we're one of the major apple growing re regions. So, you know, I'm eating like apples and pears. And then as we get close to the colder season, you know, I'll cut down. I might not cut it out, but, uh, you know, I'll certainly cut down on the amount. And, uh, I mean, you got to eat something. And then, uh, you know, starting in, um, in uh, early spring, late winter, I'll start again with blueberries and strawberries and just go through the whole cycle. So, you know, there's um, 10, th I think we mail the Orthotown magazine to 12,000 orthodontists. How come you never see uh, orthodontists really talking or marketing or... Um, having lectures about how diet affects malocclusion. For, first of all, do you, how, do you, how does diet affect malocclusion? Why are, human teeth, why are human teeth so messed up? Great, great question. Um, it affects growth and development, okay, through the process of glycation and the formation of advanced glycation end products. It's not just teeth. <clears throat> it's why in the Western world, for example, uh, women have much narrower pelvises, and you see many more C-sections. It's everybody's thinking genetically when they should be thinking epigenetically. Uh, epigenetics is basically how the environment influences gene expression. That if you're eating a lot of things that aren't species appropriate, okay, that's going to cause your face to be narrower, um, your pelvic girdle to be narrower. Um, it may stunt your growth. I mean, this is how natural selection works. And the best example I can give to you of um, epigenetics is uh, Korea. You ever been to South Korea? Yes, that's where uh, Megagen is. Okay, I bet um, the average, I'm told the average South Korean is two and a half inches taller than the average North Korean. Okay, and you're talking about people separated for 70 years by politics. Okay, in North Korea, they don't have the nutrients or the food that they have in South Korea. Korea. So the uh, development is like gates opening and closing. That if all of a sudden we open the world to North Korea and we flood the country with food, okay, everybody is still going to be two and a half inches shorter because he can't make them taller. Those, those uh, gate, gates are closed. It's the same with growth and development of the jaws. That, you know, I think it might take a generation or two to uh, sort out, but it goes back to, again, uh, environmental biology or is not, um, or is not taught. Um, orthodontists are taught how to straighten teeth. They're not taught how to prevent teeth 
from becoming crooked? That, uh, I mean, usually, you know, when you're born, you know, and, uh, you know, if your mother is feeding you cereal, by the time you're three, four, or five, I mean, uh, the die is set. You're going to have a malocclusion. Right. Um, so would you, do you just, do you tell people that you recommend the Paleolithic diet? I do, and, uh, but I don't necessarily call it that. I tend to call it um, species appropriate, which I keep using, uh, because I think to say a paleo diet, you're kind of pigeonholing it, that you can pick out, you know, 30 books on a paleo diet, and it's going to say, it's going to say meat, uh, green leafy vegetables, and fruit, okay? And um, I'm telling you that there's been a late development that, uh, you know, humans can eat a little bit of uh, dairy, that uh, there's, a, there's a gene that um, most people have that uh, will uh, make it so you can digest lactose. But again, it's one of those things your mileage can vary. Um, but, you know, species appropriate, I'm looking more at the latitude of where you are. And I think there's an emphasis on, on seafood because that's what the people that we evolved from, okay, originally ate that encephalized their brains, made us these big thinking apes. So you're also not a fan of uh, silver fillings? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not a fan of any fillings. I'm trying to prevent all fillings. But, uh, but if someone has a cavity, do, is an amalgam acceptable to you or not? I'm, I'm trying to avoid um, amalgams. I, in fact, I haven't placed an amalgam in 15 years. Um, again, the body has certain elements that it wants to work with. I'm not, I'm not saying silver fillings are going to kill you. Don't misunderstand. Um, I'm saying that your body has certain elements it wants to work with. Okay, iodine. Okay, iron, magnesium, calcium, phosphate. You know, if we can come up with, you know, better solutions that, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I've been using, uh, you know, white fillings. I've been using, um, you know, gold when I can get people to afford it. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, porcelain crown. You know, I try to stay away from silver. So, um, I don't want to switch gears. I know this is your, your passion, but, uh, gosh, I can't help but to ask about uh, forensics. How, how did you get interested in forensics? And... Um, what was that like working on 9/11? Uh, oh, that's uh, thanks for asking. Um, that was uh, just luck. I knew people. I live about an hour north of New York City, and uh, when 9/11 happened, I looked into seeing what I can do, and I knew some people on the forensic team, and they put out a call for volunteers. I didn't have any formal training in it, and uh, what I did was I went down to. Um, to uh, NYU uh, two or three times a month, and they would bring the bodies in, and we had, we had two teams. We had an anti-mortem team and a post-mortem team. The post-mortem team did just what you think. We would categorize, you know, and chart the teeth, and then we would try and, um, you know, make matches based on uh, the records that we have sent from dentists. It was uh, fascinating work. It went from about the fall of, um, 2001 through uh, June of 2002. It was uh, an experience that I'm glad I had, and I hope I never have to do it again. Man, that was that was uh, that was the biggest shock I lived through. I mean, I wasn't old enough when uh, John F. Kennedy got shot. I mean, I was born in '62. He was shot when I was one. Uh, my mother said that was uh, my level was comparable to that day. I mean, it was uh, the two the two days like that. Um, that was crazy. Um, so talk about how your interest, I mean, you were, you were talking about you examined Egyptian mummies. Um, where, where did that journey begin? Well, that began with, um, you know, one of the anthropologists that I worked with, um, Dr. Jerry Rose, uh, he's a colleague of Dr. Peter Unger's, had written a number of papers on it. And we had a meeting down at uh, Duke University and uh, he brought a number of the papers that uh, that was his area of uh, interest. And uh, I said that, that uh, you know, I had seen a couple, you know, in museums in the back rooms in New York. And uh, he said that, uh, no, they're all, they're riddled with decay. In fact, I remember one of my dental, uh, my dental books in college or in dental school, they had, they showed a picture of the world's first uh, root canal. It was in an Egyptian mummy, you know, where they just, uh, 
they opened the tooth up and they just pounded some gold down into the uh, into the root canal. So. Wow, that is. Uh, so, what about liquids? Um, drink liquids. People are like, I mean, do you drink uh, coffee, tea, uh, alcohol, beer, wine? What, what's your what's your liquids like? Um, I drink a lot of a lot of water. I mentioned, uh, you know, Pellegrino. It's a, uh, you know, uh, sparkly water. Water I like. Um, I do drink coffee in the morning, but I drink coffee black. Um, you know, no creamer, uh, no sugar. Um, I like to have a glass of wine at the end of the night, you know, with my dinner. But is that because you're Italian? Uh, you got it. So, so how do you, so it must have been very tough being raised Italian. Um, you probably grew up on pasta, spaghetti, uh, all, all the pastas. Uh, was that pretty hard to uh, uh, switch your uh, your diet from that? You know, I get that question all the time, and the answer is, is simple. If you have an emotional need to eat something that I said is bad for you, your emotions always going to win over, you know, over health. My goal is, is health. So, um, also, I noticed on your Twitter, I, I love uh, following you on Twitter. Uh, your Twitter is at Dental Q, Dental Q, D E N T A L Q U E. What what is that name? Where what does Dental Q come from? What does oh, that, that that's just. Uh, the first uh, uh, email back when AOL was the thing in the mid '90s. Okay, I had to come up with a with a handle like a CB CD hand CB handle. So I just put dental Q. I mean, my cousin's a dentist. He's Molar DG. So. Oh really? Um, yeah, I think it's funny how some of these young kids think uh, um, social media was just embedded. I mean, I. I I can remember social media from when I was a kid. I mean, when I was little in in Kansas. Uh, when I go to my friends' houses and farmers after everything was done, all the chores were done and it was dark and dinner was done, old dad or grandpa would walk out of that barn and have those big um, oh, ham radios and they'd be talking to farmers from Kansas, Nebraska, all the way up to Canada. And, and, and you know, everybody would say, oh, I'm, I'm talking about farming techniques. They would talk about baseball and the boxing fights. And, and then when they were driving the tractors, they had the CB radio, and they would talk. And so humans have been extremely social with technology. You know, I mean, the telegraph, the telephone, the ham radio, the CB, these, um, you know, the internet, the, the, the telegraph turned into the telephone, which turned into the internet. But it, it's still just so, uh, social monkeys loving to talk to each other. Um, you, you said that was, uh, I saw on your Twitter where you also tweeted um, that uh, find of the uh, 9.7 million year old tooth discovery in Germany. Uh, but you, you said that was an oddity. You don't, you don't think that rewrites the out of Africa theory? Well, the out of Africa theory, I think it's probably going to dovetail into the out of Africa theory in that um, it's, um, you know, we left Africa in uh, phases. Is it 9.3 million? Um, 9.7 million year old tooth. Oh. 9.7 million year old tooth. That, that's just wild. I, I want to. I want to see that. I want to see that verified. That. Uh, you know. Oh. Oh. You mean? Oh. So th this was published uh, on your Twitter. It's the USA Today. It was uh, October 21, 2017. So you think that still might not be uh, verified or? Or yeah, you, you're not believing it. Well, I want I want to see you know I want to see more evidence is what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm not sure it's so, just so that so that's why it's an anomaly to you because it's just one tooth. Right. Whereas, right. whereas in East Africa, in the Horn Africa, you have many yeah. specimens. By the way, Lucy is uh, right here in uh, at Arizona State University. Oh, is she? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, that was that was an amazing deal. So so are you having luck? Um, with your patients, um, I mean, are they receptive to this? Have you seen cases where people uh, change their diet because of your effort in talking to them in your practice? Absolutely, I have. I believe it works every time it's tr tried. And like I said, I think uh, one of the things about it is it transfers ownership of the problem to the patient. That, uh, you know, if, if you're going to eat things that are bad for you, you're going to continue to have the problems that you have. And then yeah. it's their choice. 
Yeah, I, and I think um, I think it's frightening. Like, um, so the the main goal of a species is to uh, eat, drink, and survive long enough to reproduce and have offspring. I mean, that, that's that's our job to reproduce, and have offspring. You're talking about uh, the out of Africa. I mean, human um, Homo sapiens have been surviving for uh, a long time, and so you would think that when you get erectile dysfunction, that should be a huge red flag. I mean once you can't reproduce and have offspring. And it's amazing how many uh, patients say, yeah, I told my doctor, so he gave me, you know, a prescription. And it's like, a prescription? I mean, something's so wrong that you can't reproduce and have offspring and you're gonna take a pill? I mean, the underlying uh, causes of that, the obesity, the diabetes, the high blood pressure, the emphysema, the smoking, the, um, you, know, you know what I mean? I mean, it's kind of a weird state of affairs we're in that, uh, that when you go to your doctor and say, I no longer can reproduce and have offspring. And they just, oh, here's a pill. Americans want a pill for everything. And here, here's what um, everybody needs to know. The underlying thing that ties this all together is the inflammatory response. That I said we're hormonally controlled, not calorically controlled. But if you have systemic inflammation, you have raised uh, cortisol levels, low vitamin D levels, okay, you might have erectile dysfunction, you might gain weight and become obese, you might have heart disease, uh, that uh, when, you, uh, when you control the hormones, you get rid of the systemic inflammation, and uh, you wouldn't need a pill for that, but then there wouldn't be somebody to sell you the pill, so they, there's no financial incentive. The financial incentive is to sell you the pill, that, you know, if you sell... You know, I'm trying to sell healthy lifestyles to people because there's no um, there's no cure. Do you want to prevent the problem or do you want to treat the problem? I think you know which side I stand on. Um, I'm so glad you mentioned vitamin D because uh, um, I live in Arizona, and the um, the bottom line is the uh, everyone in, in here gets a mixed message. You have all the dermatologists saying. Um, stay out of the sun, sunscreen, you know, lob it on, do, you know, the sun is your enemy. And then you have um, nutritionists and um, naturopaths and other people saying, oh, no, you, uh, you need sun every day for vitamin D. And, they, um, and, and some people say that if you're dressed like I am in a short sleeve shirt, that if you eat outside, you don't even have enough skin exposed that during a lunch hour you wouldn't get enough. Um, you know, but if you were completely in your bathing suit, uh, you, you would need 10 minutes every day for your vitamin D. And then, and then they come back to you and say, oh my God, if I told my dermatologist that, he'd, he'd cry. So it's a mixed message. Where, where do you sit on that? Well, vitamin D is a lecture in and of itself. That there's, uh, vitamin D has many different activated forms and some inactivated forms. Uh, vitamin, vitamin D that you make uh, through sunlight is sulfonated vitamin D. That does things that uh, better things for your body than, uh, than vitamin D supplements. I'm not a fan of supplements. I'm a fan of raising it naturally. And I can tell you, when I started this journey in 2010, just like you or anyone else, if I spent too much time in the sun, I would, I would turn beet red and start to peel. Uh, so even if people say, oh, Dr. Sarantino, you're right, I'm going to go out and catch all this natural sun, uh, you gotta work up to it. I live at about 41 degrees north latitude and I never burn. I can sit out in my backyard all day. If I go down to the Caribbean or Florida and uh, after two hours, I better get out of the sun quick or put a shirt on or I'm gonna burn. So it's basically a, a local accommodation. I'm a fan of the sun and being in the sun and the problem with dermatologists is exactly what I said at the start of this podcast, that evolutionary biology is neither taught nor a uh, prerequisite for medical school. That if they had that knowledge, okay, I think they would change their opinion. You also do um, IV or sedation. Um, what, what, what type of uh, sedation do you do for anxiety? Uh, your website says uh, nitrous oxide and sedation. Um, I work with an anesthesiologist who will come in and uh, sedate people uh, using a, a general acting, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, Diprovan, I believe is what he uses. Yeah, so you don't do the IV yourself? No, I do not. I work and, with an anesthesiologist. 
I'll just. And I, I, um, I cannot tell you how much I, re I do not recommend doing IV stations. Like, um, so being since I have a, um, I, I, since I've had a media company since '94, I've had several malpractice companies send me reams of information and data because they want to get the mess out, but. My gosh, every time it's a million dollar settlement, it's either a missed cavity or an IV sedation deal. And it, in every hospital in America, you're not allowed to do the IV surgery, I mean the IV sedation and the surgery. I mean, I, I, if I'm a car, you talk about um, um, C-sections. There's not an OBGYN in America that does the sedation and a C-section. I mean, uh, you, cardiovascular surgery, They we're the only dentist does that. Why, why, why do you think they do that? Uh, because dental insurance is not part of medical insurance, but you probably know more about that than I do. So go, go ahead. So, so what, what do you, um, what do you think of doctors doing the sedation? And, 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 and we've had some horrible accidents. I mean, there was one in Hawaii last year. I mean, uh, you know, where a child died. Um, what, what advice would you give to young kids listening to you in dental school or, or just out of school? Do you think, and, and they're tempted, maybe I should go learn sedation versus just having an anesthesiologist? Well, the first thing is that if you have everybody eating a species appropriate diet, you'll never have to take a little kid into the OR or sedate them. So, you know, again, it's prevention or treatment. Um, now, as far as actually doing it, um, we, I worked, I have a friend who's an anesthesiologist, and uh, he would come in and sedate the patients for me. Uh, now, he would get a separate fee for that. And the reason I think in dentistry you don't see much of that at all is the fact that dental insurance is different than medical insurance. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like we were, the, we were the odd man out. So, but, uh, you know, it's certainly that's not something I do in this office. Does medical insurance uh, cover um, sedation when they come into your office with an anesthesiologist? No. Not at all. They, they do not. Yeah, I, I just I just cannot stress enough that uh, if you want to do sedation, become a board certified anesthesiologist and just do it full time. Uh, and by the way, my oral surgeon right up the street from me, uh, Greg Edmonds, um, he agreed with that. Uh, he, he was the first oral surgeon I knew, I knew that agreed with that. But he, he even says, not only is that the standard of care in every hospital in Arizona, which he wants to, to, to meet or exceed, but he says also it's a practice management builder because he, uh, he, does, he, he doesn't have to waste all the time going in there and starting IV. I mean, when he goes in there, they're all ready to go and he goes and does his stuff. He, he, he thinks uh, he sees far more patients uh, by having a full-time anesthesiologist in his office. Well, my wife uh, had a three C-sections, and uh, we had it done with an epidural. Do you know what medicine they use? Fentanyl. Lidocaine. Lidocaine? Lidocaine. Okay, and the anesthesiologist got $1,000. I mean, yeah. we, we're giving it away, you know, yeah. when do for a filling. Uh, and they, they don't use that much more, maybe two or three carpules. They use lidocaine, not even articaine. Uh, are there any other questions that I wasn't smart enough to ask you? No, I think you got through everything. I think um, the most important thing to realize is um, the thing that ties everything together is the chronic inflammation that, um, you know, periodontists have been looking for years, okay, for the periosystemic link. I have the answer. The answer is systemic inflammation. It depends where the inflammation where the weak point in your body is. That, um, I mean, they're just waiting to find that uh, periodont uh, periodontitis is a, um, is a, a uh, key trigger for heart disease. And it's not the case at all. It's the systemic inflammation caused by uh, consumption of carbohydrates and glycation and formation of advanced glycation and products. Um, also, uh, uh, lack of sleep, okay, uh, cortisol reversal, I mean, are things that, you know, drive, drive the um, uh, systemic inflammation. And these, these are all big problems in our society that I tell people, eat a species-appropriate diet, respect the circadian cycle, and respect the circa-annual cycle, and uh, you will do well. Do not get up at 3 in the morning, okay, and check your uh, phone for messages. That bright white light and blue light 
tells the reptilian part of your brain that it's day and it starts secreting cortisol at a time when it should be low. Okay, this all plays into it. And maybe instead of saying species appropriate diet, I should say a species appropriate environment. Okay, that's dark nights, that's daylight during the day, that's going to bed at a reasonable time, and uh, and uh, eating what we talked about. What was your, you said circadian cycle and you said another cycle. Circa annual. So the circadian for the year, the annual cycle. Okay. That's when, okay, um, you shouldn't be, don't eat strawberries in December. Um, and back, back to the periodontist, um, there, there's still a lot of people, um, even dentists, debating whether or not um, decay and periodontal disease is contagious. I mean, obviously, below the belt, um, everybody knows STDs are contagious below the belt, but what about kissing? Uh, do, do, do you think decay and periodontal disease are contagious diseases? You know, that's a great question because um, I will admit there's a certain point where um, what's contagious is the bacteria. That, you know, mothers, if you have strep mutans, mother's going to pass that to baby or friend to friend. But if you don't eat the substrate, if you have a low carb diet, you're never going to get the disease. Ha, huh, very, very interesting. So uh, it's, once again, it's the environment driving it. Okay. All right. Well, hey, um, it really was an honor for you. To, uh, I know it's uh, you stayed at the end of the day uh, to uh, you should have been home having your glass of wine and you decided to stay an hour and talk to me and my homies. And I just want to tell you that I, I really, really appreciate that. Um, it's been uh, an honor podcasting you. And I look forward to uh, the links on this thread under um, under uh, health is nutrition and that you'll post season nutritions and just thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, thanks Howard, it's a pleasure. Uh, give me a day or two to uh, put it together, but I'll definitely do it this week. All right, thank you so much. Have okay. a walking hot day.